Welcome, everybody. It's a great uh, pleasure uh, to have uh, all of you in this uh, uh, course of Mexican art uh, history organized by the National Autonomous University of, of Mexico. And before I introduced our uh, first uh, guests, uh, I want to tell you uh, if you can switch off your cameras and your microphones and in order that we can have a fluent uh, uh, connection. Uh, the conferences, the conference is going to give, is going to be uh, uh, in, in English and after uh, the conference is over, we will have a Q and R a session, and all the questions uh, have to be written in in English in the in the chat. Uh, so first of all, I, I would like to uh, to give the floor to the director of the uh, Foreign uh, Teaching uh, Center, a Centro de Enseñanza para Extranjeros, uh, Doctor uh, Alberto uh, Vital. Good morning, I welcome you today, Tuesday, April 27th, 2021, or should I say tomorrow, April 27th, 2021, because here in Mexico it is still Monday, Monday night. The worldwide electronic networks allows us to take this course from Mexico to China today. We are all together building the future right now. The course is being held between the head quartiers of the National Autonomous University of Mexico in China, which is directed by Dr. Guillermo Polido, and the Spanish Language Center for Foreign Students, which I direct. I highlight and celebrate the participation of the Central Academy of Fine Arts of China and the Beijing Foreign Studies uh, University. The course begins with a pre-Hispanic the period continues with the New Spain between the 16th and early 19th centuries and the late 19th century and the 20th century already in independent Mexico and ends with some representative currents of the present. In other words, in this course, the students will be given an approach to the art of the of Mexico, starting with the pre-Hispanic period through the New Spain period and the 19th and 20th century. We will, we will give you the, the main characteristics of each period, its historical context, and the most representative examples. Let me say you, let me say you that in our center, we have a wide range of uh, online courses and diplomas to learn Spanish and to learn more about the richness of Mexican cultures. If you are interested, please visit our website and our social networks. We also have many free activities, such as high quality and topical conferences. I conclude by thanking Dr. Guillermo Pulido, Maestro Javier Cuetara, and their teams, as well as the Central Academ Academy of fine arts of China. I am sure that our activities will be very, very successful. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alberto Vital. And now we are going to give the floor to the director of the representation Office of the National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, Dr. Guillermo Pulido. Good morning, everyone. The director of the Mexican Study Center of the National Autonomous University of Mexico in China. It is a great honor to present the scholars from our prestigious university that will lecture 
about Mexican art history. Professor Mariana Favila Vázquez is an archaeologist from the National School of Anthropology and History, graduated from the doctorate program at the National Autonomous University of Mexico in Mesoamerican Studies. Her postgraduate thesis was awarded and published by UNAM. Her research focuses on indigenous navigation traditions, spatial analysis in archaeology and history, and the digital humanities. Professor Avan Flores Moran is also an archaeologist from the National School of Anthropology and History and obtained his doctorate degree in the art history by the National Autonomous University of Mexico. He was awarded with the Alfonso Caso Medal by UNAM in 2014 and has collaborated in several archaeological projects in South of Mexico. His research focuses on the study of the transformation, continuities, and consisting of the indigenous people during the 16th century. After the conference, we will give a space to questions and answer session with the audience. Last but not least, I would like to thank the director of the Learning Center for Foreign Students at UNAM, Dr. Alberto Vital, and the head of the cultural department, Javier Cuetara, for their support in making this lecture possible. Professor Mariana Favila and Avan Flores, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much. Well, Professor uh, Mariana Favila and Avan Flores, uh, we, we, we can start. And I remind, remind everybody to turn off your microphones and, and, and cameras. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pablo. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. OK. Um, so before we start, uh, Avan and I would like to thank the invitation to this event, to all the institutions involved that made it possible to organize it, despite the situation we are all familiar with. Thank you, of course, to all the people interested and the, that is actually here now with us. We hope you enjoy what we have prepared for you. So welcome everyone to the Mexican Art History Online course. Let's begin. In the following three sessions, as Dr. Alberto Vital has already explained, we will present the development of art in Mexico. But we must remember that this nation did not exist until the 19th century. So, in this first session, we will explain pre-Hispanic art, which includes all the artistic manifestations before the arrival of the Spaniards in the 16th century. In the second session tomorrow, we will approach the audience to the art of the colonial period. We will end this course in session number three with modern and contemporary art. Since we have so much information that we want to share with you, and we don't really have as much time as we need, I am going to explain all the contents. And Avan, who is actually the, the great mind behind everything you're going to see, will be here to answer any questions you may have. Let's begin. We are not going to explain all the internal regionalization of what we know as Mesoamerica, the cultural area of the ancient Mexico, and that you can see here with all the colors. I'm just going to, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, but we wanted to present you this general map of the territories we are going to be talking about. I want you to try to remember through all the session today, at least the, the Gulf Coast here in blue, the Mayan area here, central Mexico, and the modern state of Oaxaca, where Montalban is. Uh, either way, this map is going to be appearing in the upper right corner of your screen. So you have all the time a geographical reference and you don't get lost in what we are saying. 
Also, we don't want to confuse anyone by explaining all the different periods that we use to study ancient Mexico. But you will see in almost every slide a timeline so you can follow the dates we are talking about. And therefore, everything makes more sense. This is basically because we are summing up 4,000 years of pre-Hispanic history in less than one hour. So I hope this helps everyone to have a, a geographic and a time reference all the time. Let's begin then. Um, for the first 15,000 years after the arrival of the first men and women to the American continent, humans were organized in small groups. And let's not forget that they were nomads. They hunted, they fished, and gathered different resources in order to survive. But until it wasn't until 2500 BC that they began to live in small villages that didn't have any more than 20 small houses, something like the example that you can see in the image. After the invention of agriculture, these groups were established in permanent settlements and were socially egalitarian, meaning no social classes existed among them. So the first artistic manifestations we wanted to show you are these female figurines that these groups began to create. The main characteristics of these female figurines is that they have these white hips and detailed work in their face. Uh, as we can see in this image, these first, these first figurines actually are starting to reflect some internal social difference among this group. For example, the first figurine, the first figurine here called Pretty Woman could be a female priest, while the other one, this one here, could be a common woman holding a dog. These two examples are just two of many, many hundreds of other examples of this kind of female figurines, which actually are also related to the idea of fertility. Something very important that has to be clear from the beginning is that all the artistic representations that we are going to be explaining are related to social, political, and religious concepts and the worldview of all of these ancient people. These two figurines actually come from central Mexico. So this is the map that I was mentioning at the beginning. And this, I hope you can see the, the timeline in, in the bottom. And, um, okay, let's continue. Oops. Around 1200 BC, advances in agriculture allowed the growth of the population. And with that came the specialization of work. As a consequence, the first ceremonial centers made with perishable materials were created. These first complex settlements have been related to the Olmec culture that we usually tend to identify in the South Gold Coast of Mexico. These first complex this, these are the, the, the artistic manifestations of this culture were related to religious and political power, as well with the manipulation of nature. Um, I believe that someone has the microphone on, so if you could please turn it, turn it off so that we don't have that echo behind. Thank you. So this is an example of uh, one of these first ceremonial complex centers in South uh, Veracruz here where the arrow is pointing in the map. Among the new social classes that emerged in this Olmec culture were the priests who communicated with the gods and manipulated the forces of nature. They began to have more power and rule over the people. So that is why they started being represented as in the sculpture that you can see in the image. For this period, these kind of people, the priests, were, were represented with great naturalism and a face with rough features, almond-shaped eyes, a flat nose, and the corners of the lips turned down. The Olmec art was developed 
not only in the south part of the Gulf Coast of Mexico, but throughout all the whole, the whole Mexican territory. So we can find the Olmec style in, cent in the center of Mexico or even in the coast of the Pacific. Examples of this artistic style were carved in stone. In the slide, you can see a man which has been identified as a king, even if we don't really know if, it, if he was a king, he has been in the identified as a ruler. He is inside a cave, while light outside is raining. It seems to be raining outside. I'm going to show you this image, which is a little bit more clear. So what we have here is a ruler or a king depicted sitting inside the cave, producing the air, which is this image here, that eventually would create the cloud. And the cloud would provoke the rain and, in consequence, the growth of vegetation. So this image is actually evoking the power of the ruler to make rain. This kind of topic, the depiction of the power of the rulers to control the forces of nature, was very important in, the, in this first kind of example. One of the most characteristic works of this period was the colossal head. They were also created by the Olmecs and they could reach more than three meters high and weighed about 10 tons. What we see here is the head or the face of one ruler represented. It's very probable that this sculpture actually was created after the ruler died. Archaeologists in Mexico have discovered 17 of these amazing sculptures. And I wanted to show you how impressive is the size of these sculptures. And this is a photograph of one of the discoveries of, of one of these colossal heads in the 20th century in southern Veracruz. Now we move on in time to a period of pre-Hispanic history where the first city-state in central Mexico was created. Many of you may be familiar with this city. The name is Teotihuacan. When Teotihuacan was having a great development in, by its society and the political, uh, every, all the political uh, processes that they were having, 200,000 people lived there. And this provoked that the city was the fifth, the fifth largest city in the ancient world. It's very important to understand that before Teotihuacan, there was a pre-Hispanic world. And after Teotihuacan, there is another completely different pre-Hispanic world. So Teotihuacan is like a very important point in this, in this lecture, actually. The city had streets, drains, administrative areas, houses, among many other services that every city required. There were three ceremonial temples that were significant, and we will explain the artistic features in them. The first one is actually in this recreation, in this reconstruction, back here, behind this large pyramid here. The second one is, of course, this one here, and the third one is this one here. So I'm going to explain why each one of these temples is important and which were the artistic, the artistic features in them in the East. The first temple that was important and that was built in Teotihuacan was the Pyramid of the Feather Serpent, or as we know it, Quetzalcoatl, the Temple of Quetzalcoatl. This building had representations of serpents surrounded by seashells and snails which related the temple with water. There is a reconstruction of this pyramid. What we see here is the head of the serpent, or Quetzalcoatl, as we know him, as we know it, the body of the serpent, which is also represented here, and, we, and which is actually speaking to us of an analogy with the water and watery environment. Also here, you have these circles. The circles are, are very important. They are called chalchihuites, and they are referring to what is precious, to what is divine, to what is aquatic. So 
you see this is like a, is, is an aquatic environment representing two creatures actually. Not only the feather serpent here, which has all the body and the tail here, but also this creature here. Um, it's very difficult to actually explain what this is. We call it turquoise, turquoise creature. It's uh, some kind of monster related to probably the perception or the idea of what the Earth's surface was, but it hasn't really been um, totally explained by archaeologists and historians. But well, what we want to show you is that these depictions of these creatures in the watery environment is very important and also related to power. Between the years 0 and 250 AD, the city was painted with colorful, colorful murals, where animals considered as forces of nature were painted on the walls. What we see here in this image is an, maybe probably an eagle, and we have many other representations in the Tihuacan of mural paintings with other animals such as jaguars and other types of birds. By the year 250, the pyramid of Quetzalcoatl wasn't so important anymore, meaning that the cult to Quetzalcoatl stopped being important for some reason that we don't really know yet. And actually, the, the pyramid of Quetzalcoatl was covered with another pyramid. But um, in 250 AD, a new pyramid, 60 meters high, was built which actually became the most important pyramid at this moment. This is the pyramid of the sun, the one you can see in the picture. The excavations and research carried out in this place have shown that there is a spring in the center of the building. So when the, the people arrive here, they actually find it, found this spring, water emerging from earth, and decided that they wanted to construct this huge pyramid to cover this spring. Around the pyramid, there was a canal that surrounded the pyramid also with water. So what we can see here is that water is a very important topic related to religious and political power. Likewise, archeologists found fragments of the pyramid's decoration, such as chalchihuites, which were carved in these stone blocks, as you can see, and jaguar heads, which also relate to the pyramid, to this aquatic environment and this particular animal that is related to water, specifically to water that arose from the earth. When Teotihuacan was having this amazing development, not just um, economic development, but also political and religious uh, development, many mural paintings were made. And in some of them, only the color red was used as the one in as the one you can see in the slide. Apparently, red was a color that was associated to political power. And it's possible that at some point in the history of the Tihuacan, the whole city was painted in red. You see now that the pyramids are colorless. We can only see the stone of the building, but when they were actually, you know, uh, people living there, the, the pyramids were covered with colors, and one of these colors was red. And again, as I was saying, many mural paintings were um, decorated only using this color. The topics that we can find in these mural paintings include people, people, uh, animals eating human hearts, um, animals among many other figures, and also a specific god that began to be depicted in this moment, such as Tlaloc, which is quite famous. He is the god of rain, you may be familiar with him. And something very important that I have to mention in this point is that in Teotihuacan, we have no representation of a ruler. I mean, a specific king with his name, or, you know, like it, that we can identify. We have representations of priests, we have representations of gods, but we don't have a representation of a ruler, of a king. That is very important. Finally, at some point in 600 AD, 
Teotihuacan began to have internal problems. Uh, the hypotheses to explain the fall of Teotihuacan are many, but one of the important things that I have to explain at this point is that in this late period of the history of Teotihuacan, another important building was also uh, created. This other building was the Pyramid of the Moon, and it became the second largest structure of the city behind the Pyramid of the Sun. So you can see here a picture of the Pyramid of the Moon. We know that this building was also dedicated to a goddess related to water. The name of this goddess is Chalchitlique, and she was the goddess of the lake. Which lake? A generic lake. <laughs> it's, it may, they may be a specific lake in that moment, but now that lake doesn't exist, so we can understand that this goddess was actually related to lakes. And, um, these sculptures were actually found in the base of the building with, actually there were found two of them. And this again is showing us how important uh, the, the environment and the water was to these people. As I was saying, at some point in history, around 650 AD, the Tihuacan started to have all these problems. And in this period, uh, we start to find Again, mural paint paintings, as the ones that you can see in the slide, that are, are actually depicting very, a very curious topic. What we see in this slide is the mural painting from the Pantitla, which is supposed to be representing like a sacred place called Tlalocan or the paradise of Tlaloc. Remember, that Tlaloc was the god of rain. What we see here is a mountain which has water emerging from this mountain, probably from a cave. This may be at the entrance of a cave. And we see a lot of people. We don't really know if they are men or women. We just know that they are humans and they are doing many things. What kind of things are they doing? They are playing here, for example. They are singing, they are dancing, they are even swimming and doing some other stuff. What is this mural trying to express? Well, it's not very clear either, <laughs> but maybe one interpretation is that the political, the, the persons that hold the power in Teotihuacan were trying to express that Teotihuacan was a city in joy, that was a city um, that, that was, you know, happy people that had enough resources, uh, crops here, that what we see here is a representation of the crops, um, etc. So it may be a way to try to minimize the problems, the political and social problems that Teotihuacan was having at this point. And again, you can see that the color red is very important. Again, red is always related to power. Now we're going to move to another region in Mesoamerica. As I was saying, Teotihuacan was the first city state that Mesoamerica had. It was a very important city that had relationships with many places far from the, from, far from the center of Mexico. And one of the cities was Tikal in Guatemala. You can see in the map how far from actual, from, from Mexico, uh, from Teotihuacan it was. So, uh, of course, this, this wasn't the only city that Teotihuacan had relations with, but the reason we decided to show you this culture called Stella, it's a Stella, the Stella 31 from Tikal, is because in the Maya region, once Teotihuacan started to fall with in, in, its, in its political power, the Mayan were one of the people that actually came, became to became important and started to have important manifestations and more political power after the Tehuacan declined. Also, one of the reasons we wanted to show you this culture, this is this Estela, is because it is depicting three three persons, three three, three people here. We see three persons here. In the center, we see a king, a Maya king, Tia Chancawil, who is dressed with all the Mayan paraphernalia, which you can see it's extremely complex, 
And next to him, in both sides, appears another person, a male, that is actually dressed with Teotihuacan clothes with a symbol. He is supposed to be the father of this king. So what we are seeing here is an extremely clear representation of this political relationship between the Teotihuacan and the Tikal. Also, if you remember, I mentioned that in Teotihuacan, we didn't have any portrait, any representation of any ruler. We don't know who was ruling in Teotihuacan. But in the Mayan area, what we have are these stelas that are actually representing very clear with their names and even dates, who is who and who did what in, the, in this period. So that is like a very important difference. And we have many, many representations of this type of stelas all over the Maya area. For example, one, uh, one example that is very well known is the stelas in Copan, in also right, this is Guatemala, in Honduras. So what we have here, as I was saying, is that the art is really strongly linked to rulers and even the representation of when these rulers were made captive, meaning if one city, for example, Calakmul, uh, had a war, a confrontation with another city and captive the ruler, they would create one sculpture to represent this ruler that had been made captive and even include the symbols of the names and the city that this person was uh, belonged or, or original. So this is the kind of narratives that we have in this representation. Now let's move to another place, an amazing archaeological site that if you ever have the chance to visit, please do, Bonampak, Bonampak in Chiapas, in the state of Chiapas in Mexico. What we have here is the first, well, not the first, but one of, uh, some of the most amazing mural paints uh, from the Mayan world. What we see here are ritual and political ceremonies where even more than 30 different colors were occupied to create this amazing scene. So I'm going to try to explain the narrative that we see in this room, in this specific room. At some point, a child was born. He was the son of a king that you can see here. And he decided that he wanted to introduce his baby to the noble of this place, of Bonampak. So he creates all these rituals and ceremonies to, to, to introduce his, his child. Here he is holding the child who is going to be eventually the successor of this king. And these are the noble, king, the noble king persons that he is introducing the baby to. They are not looking to the baby. What are they, look, what are they looking at? Well, they are looking at the ceremonies on the name and on behalf of this baby. Let's see what these ceremonies are about. In another scene of this mural painting, we see this scene where we can see what the rituals and ceremonies were. We have people playing different, um, making music, and we have also the participants of a ball game match, the players of a ball game match that would or maybe took place at some point, and they have they are wearing these curious masks and costumes. And at the same time, in another scene from the same room in Bonampak, we have the depiction of a war, a confrontation taking place between probably people from Bonampak and someone else, another crew. These two persons, uh, those, these two men here are wearing these um, amazing uh, costumes, you know, from, for, the, for, like, for the military uh, action. And it's been in, so it's supposed to be that they are they are wearing these necklaces that you can see here with the probably heads of two men or maybe even masks. We don't really know that. And they are making captive these people here. Um, I want to uh, point out that we know, apart from the obvious, you know, of the obviously of, of what we see in the scene, one way to know that someone is taking captive someone else is because they hold their head, the, the hair with the hands. We are going to see these kind of representations in many other places apart from the Mayan area. In this, sea, in this scene, we see the victorious groups at the top of the pyramid. 
while the defeated are on the floor. They appear almost naked since all of their elegant clothes have been taken away. And if you can see, they are actually looking to their hands with an expression of pain because their nails have been removed from their fingers and blood is coming out from their fingers. Above here, a character, a man is pleading for his life. While here we have a dead person lying in the floor. Apart from all these ceremonies that were taking places, uh, women also participated. In this scene, what we have are noble women and what they are doing is that they are, they cut their tongues, they pricked their tongues and then passed a thick cord through the hole of the tongue, expecting that the cord would be soaked in blood. And then they would offer this, this cord with blood as an offering and we, they would burn it and offer it in the name of the God. So this is the kind of themes and topics that we can see in this mural. This Mayan world near the end of the first millennium began to change. The new ideological and social systems were reflected in architecture. The Mayans started to build temples representing a fantastic creature related to the Earth's surface. This is important that I explain a little bit more. Uh, Mayan had this idea that the surface of the Earth or the air was a creature that had some reptilian uh, features. It's not really very clear what this monster was. But this is connected to the idea that this building is actually representing the mouth of this monster, of this creature. So you can see here the teeth of this creature. And it's also related to the idea that the, the governor, the ruler, would come out from the building as if he was coming out from the underworld. It's like a sacred space that only the rulers and some nobles had access to and common people wouldn't have any kind of access to these spaces. And the idea of presenting this amazing architecture was to impress people, common people. Also, the gods were very important to them and many of the buildings, like the one you can see here in Cabal, Yucatan, were actually, the, the walls were covered with the faces of some of these uh, gods. In this case, what we see here is the face of the god of rain, Chak, which is like the, um, the parallel figure of Tlaloc in, the, in, in, the central, in central Mexico. Um, also, this uh, deity that is represented here could be Itzabna, which is the, one of the most important gods in the Mayan religion. So we don't, it's, it's not very clear who, it may be both, it may be one or the other, but what we wanted to show you is this amazing uh, architecture, uh, decoration and features in the building. As I was saying, after the fall of Teotihuacan, many other societies in Mesoamerica had also a huge impact. I mean, not only the Maya arose after the decline of the Teotihuacan society, but also many other cities. One of the cities was Monte Alban in Oaxaca. We were, uh, who lived there were the Zapotecs, uh, that is the ethnic group that we um, relate to the city. And here a very different type of art was created. In Oaxaca and in Monte Alban and in other places as Suchitil Tongo, which is the one, uh, the one example you can see in the slide, Mm, people worship their ancestor, and to show the highest respect, they built beautiful tombs with impressive entrances, where inside the walls were covered with paintings, paintings like the one I'm going to show now. The walls inside were decorated with funerary processions of nobles, offering the respect to the deceased ruler. This kind of paintings actually can be related to the ones that we see in the royal tombs in Egypt. It's obviously not the same, but it's kind of the same idea. 
From year 900 AD, so you can have an idea of where in time we are at the point of the lecture, new centers of power emerge throughout, throughout all the territory. In the case of the Gulf Coast in Veracruz, in the modern state of Veracruz, on the east coast of Mexico, the city of Tajin became very important. Here, the pyramid of niches, the Pyramid de los Nichos, was built, a unique building of its kind. In central Mexico, other cities, such as Xochicalco, arose. The people in this city have an intense relationship with the Mayan area. This is why in this city, archeologists have found also stelas, like the ones we saw in Tikal and Copan. Well, in Xochicalco, they have also been found. And they have also identified in the decoration of the main building, the one that you can see in the picture, a feathered serpent which is a reminiscence of the Quetzalcoatl that we also saw in Teotihuacan. It's not the same, it's not the same cult, it's not the same god, but it, it is related. And actually this god in this moment in 900 AD appear also in the Mayan area. This is quite a topic. <laughs> I hope someone asks about this. Another city called Cacaxla, also in central Mexico, show shows one example of these relations between the Mayan area and central Mexico. In Cacaxla, we have these mural paintings where we can see a battle. But the battle depicted and the scene is actually very similar to the ones that we saw in Bonampak, if you remember. The colors that are being used here and the naturalistic way in which it's depicted is not very common in central Mexico. So this is a clear, 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 clear um, um, evidence of the uh, influence of the Mayan area. Uh, maybe some uh, Mayan, area, Mayan, Mayan artists came to, to Kakashla and painted this, wall, this mural painting. So this period of great dynamism would be interrupted with migrations of northern groups of nomads that began to arrive to Mesoamerica around one, the year 1000 AD. They reached the center of Mexico and also the Mayan area. The arrival of these groups created a new art where the topics of war and sacrifice were very important. Two cities are very important in the, at this time, Tula in central Mexico and Chichen Itza in Yucatan. They both actually have very similar art and they are representing, always representing themselves as warriors, which are the topics that we see in both cities. For example, Zompantli. What is a Zompantli? It's what you see in the, in the picture. A Zompantli was a structure, actually a wood structure, with a succession of human skulls. What we see here is not a, an actual Zompantli, but a representation of a Zompantli. And the interpretation of this kind of um, structures showing the human skulls is that maybe they created fear in the people that saw this structure. You can imagine what people felt when they saw this. So it is again a manifestation of power, of political power. Also in Chichen Itza and in Tula, we find representations of eagles. Here is not really clear, but here is an eagle uh, and it's actually eating a human heart. And these cities uh, began to lose power around 1250. And by 1325, the year 1325, a new group appeared on scene. Yes, which is very, um, probably you have heard from them. So the Aztecs arrived in central Mexico in 1325. They are actually related to these groups of nomads that are coming from the north to central Mexico. And it wasn't until the 15th century that they reached the power, their power. As you know, probably, the group built a city in the middle of a lake in the Valley of Mexico, Tenochtitlan, which must have been really impressive because of all the architecture and everything that they did to the landscape to be able to live there. This culture expressed power in all their objects, basically. For example, this is the Tistoc stone. What we see here is a stone carved with the representations of 
make master rulers holding captives rulers from other cities. So if you remember, I show you, we show you the image in Bon I, I, yeah, in Bonamac where a warrior was holding was holding the hair of a captive. Again, we see the same representation here. This is how they represent the conquest. And it's very probable that this stone actually, when it was being in use, was covered with colors. Now we don't see these colors because the colors have been lost. And they use this stone to actually make sacrifices in this part, or probably um, put there the hearts of something from uh, after a sacrifice was uh, taking place in, in this stone. Other topic that was related to the Aztecs in their artistic manifestation was the conception of time. For example, in the famous uh, stone of the sun, which is the one that you can see here in this slide. And what we see here are the different days of the calendars in this inner circle here. And two serpents that are actually representing to be carrying the sun through the sky. So that is what we see. Deities, goddess and gods were also sculpted. This is Tlaltecutl. She was the goddess of the earth. Again, related to this idea that the earth was a, a living, um, a living or, or a living person or a living animal or something. She was represented as a woman. We know that she's a woman because she actually have, has her, her breast. Um, she has her skin yellow which is a color related to fertility. And she has uh, this large breast and uh, her belly because she was the mother of all people. It is supposed that she was, uh, sorry, she was, um, she fed on blood that reached her mouth. We don't really know if the, the blood is coming out from her mouth or if the blood is actually entering her mouth. But okay, so that is what we, have in this, uh, in this monolith that was found in Casa de las Ajaracas in Templo Mayor in modern, in modern city of Mexico, Mexico City in 2006. From this period, we also have codex or codices, as we know, them, the, book, the books of the Aztecs, which were made with large bands of paper or deer skin. This object was covered with lime, then painted, on top and then folded, for you, as you can see in the picture. We, we decided to include this kind of representation because usually they are considered artistic objects. They were not really made with that uh, intention. They were, yeah, books, you know, as in the concept that we have kind of in the modern society. And we wanted to explain one of the narratives that we can find in, in, in this kind of uh, context. For example, this is a codex from the Mystic, from the Mystics, which is not central Mexico, is in, in, the, in the coast, Pacific coast. And what we see here is a, a play, a, a yeah, page of the codex, and the reading narrative starts here, not here as you would think, but here. So I'm going to quickly explain what we see here. Uh, what we are looking here in the first section in this corner is uh, the story of the confrontation between the humans or the mystics and one tribe of people that were made of stone. These stone men, which are here depicted with lines in their bodies, arrived from some place and uh, made captive this woman here. Again, see how she's, she's holding her hair. This happened in these places. Tachillo, the, the head hill, the hill of the rain. These are the glyphs, the glyphs to represent places. And these here are the representations of the dates. The, num the names of the dates are very strange. For example, date uh, is the day six dog and the year six came. I'm, I'm not going to explain more of that. So in this first thing, we see this, that these people arrive, the stone people arrive, the stone men arrive, and they make up to this woman. And then in the upper section of the, of the page, we see another scene, which is the continue, uh, the continuation of the narrative. And what we see here is that the stone men are so strong that they, even animals are trying to fight with them, but they, they are very strong. So they, they cannot be defeated. 
by, by human. At some point, a god decides to come down from the sky. This, this is the god here, Seven Snake. And he helps the humans to defeat the, the stone men. And what we see here is finally a human, or god, uh, taking out the heart <laughs> of one of the stone men. It's curious that the stone man has a human heart. It's what the story is telling us about. And this happened in different, probably different um, dates. But what is important that it is that the, the gods have to intervene to help the human. In the third section of the story, what we see is that the humans start to make, to capture all these uh, stone men. And you can see here different people, with, their names are also quite strange. Seven dog, five dog, five dog, stone snake, and they are making up the stone men, again by holding their head, as you can see here in this image. Um, this narrative ends with, um, the narrative ends with a ceremony where a woman, this woman here, apparently, is beheaded, probably sacrificed, and several people of her plate with blood and knives, and also an opossum, this little animal here, uh, which is related to the idea of a cycle that ends. So it makes sense if you understand what this, each symbol is related to. Also, many calendars were created. Uh, I mean, this, this book, the codices were not only used to represent histories, but they were also used to register calendar or the passage of the time and how each day had an essence that affected a particular group of people. What we see here is the Codex Borgia in the plate 53 which is representing the uh, planet Venus and how this planet specifically affected the fate of women and warriors, among many other things. So this is another use of this type of object. Even the products uh, that had to be delivered to the Aztecs were registered and depicted and represented in this type of document. For example, what we see here is what kind of tributes the Aztec received from the people that they had under the control. For example, here in the bottom of the page, we have the toponyms, meaning the places, the names of the places that are actually giving their tribute to the Aztecs. And what were they giving? Okay, we have here feathers, we have animal skins, we have costumes, we have blankets, we have jewelry, among other things. So this is another kind of representation and use for this uh, for the codices. Okay, so we reach uh, 1521. What happens is that um, the Spaniards arrive. This is a representation of a, a colonial codex. We are going to be talking about this tomorrow. The Florentine Codex, which is an amazing uh, document. And what we see here is a representation from the 16th century for the arrival of the Spaniards to the Gulf Coast, to the coast of Veracruz, probably Veracruz, the modern Veracruz. And I love this particular scene, and I ask Avan to include it, because here is a, an indigenous spy that was sent uh, by Moctezuma, the king or the ruler of the Aztecs in, in, in Tenochtitlan, and he actually was sent to this coast to see what was happening. And when he came back to, to Moctezuma to let him know what he saw, he said, uh, Moctezuma, well, not, not maybe Moctezuma, but ruler, king, what I saw were floating mountains. <laughs> and this was very strange, because why, why floating mountains? He was referring to the boats. Um, so Moctezuma didn't believe him actually, and he jailed, he put him in jail and sent another spy, a second spy. But when the second spy went back to Moctezuma and repeated the same story, Moctezuma had to accept that something very strange was happening in the coast. So this is the end of this first uh, part of the course because this is exactly when the Spaniards arrived. So I'm going to just wrap up some of the things that we have seen around in this uh, last hour. Uh, just to wrap up, to sum up, 
finish this first session, uh, we wanted to show you this last slide in order to try to give you a general um, idea, some general idea. What we have seen in this first session in one hour is that the first villages, the first permanent villages in 2500 and 1300 BC, um, female figurines were produced. This is the kind of art that was produced in this, in this period. And uh, these figurines, these female figurines were very common and they were related to the idea of perfume. Then between 1400 BC and 200 BC, when the Olmec culture develops, what we see is that the art is very, very related to political and religious power, but also with the manipulation of nature and with some ideas that we'll repeat in the, the, and, and the, in the following periods, such as the idea of the importance of the caves, for example. Between 200 BC and 658 and 650 uh, is when Teotihuacan uh, is established. And what we saw in this period specifically, specifically related to Teotihuacan is that power is really related to aquatic environment and the representation of animal as nature forces and power. Then after the decline of Teotihuacan, we moved to the Mayan area and to some cities, to some of the cities that arose in the center of Mexico, such as Cacaxtla and Xochicalco, where some of the relations between far places such as the Mayan area and central Mexico were represented in the, in the mural paintings, so, such as the one that we saw in Cacaxtla. Also the importance of the representations of specific rulers such as the ones that we see in the Stella de Ortical, and also some um, topics related to war. Between 900 and 1250, uh, what we saw is that there were these migrations and these groups that were coming from the north that actually created a whole new world. And this was reflected in two main cities, Tula and Chichen Itza. And the relationships between these uh, two, two cities can be seen in their, actually in their art, which is always referring to these people as warriors and with this sacrifice and um, kind of a violent topic. Finally, in 12, between 1250 and 1521, we, see, we saw the Aztecs and how the main topics related to, to the, their art are is conquest, war, sacrifice, and even registration of uh, tribute and pact. And uh, how the mystics, for example, among many other societies, participant societies, use the codex as narrative to, to, to register their own histories, narratives, and worldview related to the calendar. So I hope this is clear. I hope this has given you, we hope that this has given you a general scope of the main topics related to a specific examples through all the <laughs> time that we have covered. And if you have any questions, we'll be very happy to answer. So thank you so much for your attention. Again, Avan and I are very pleased to be here with you and we hope that you can join us tomorrow. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Mariana Favila, for your excellent uh, presentation and conference. Um, uh, we would like to welcome the audience to uh, uh, write their questions in the chat and we, we can answer s some of their questions. Thank you very much. Okay, so everything was super clear. <laughs> We can hear you with with confidence. You you can ask something to the academic uh, to the scholars. Uh, there is the question. There is the first uh, question. Uh, they were only ceremonies related to uh, po politic to politics or other types of ceremonies. No, no, no. There were many kinds of uh, types of ceremonies. Of course, it depends. There are certain types of ceremonies that occurred. Uh, throughout all the history, throughout um, 
in the whole history of pre-Hispanic societies. Uh, for example, there were ceremonies to uh, when the baby was born, or when a baby, or when a woman was going to have a baby, uh, when a governor or a ruler would die, for example, there would be different kinds of ceremonies also. Um, yeah, so in in general, the topics could be really, you know, like different. And um, but what, what we wanted to show you was uh, how many of the different topics are in common between these different societies. And of course, one of the topics that is always present, you know, is the political top, uh, yeah, theme. But no, ceremonials, it could even include, you know, to try to speak to a god. So there are depictions in Yakshilan, Estelas, for example, in the Estelas from Yakshilan, where a woman is trying to connect with a god and she is depicted doing this kind of things of uh, pricking her tongue with a cord, you know, in order to to establish some kind of connection with the gods. That is another type of ceremony also. Uh, can I recommend, uh, I'm, I'm reading the questions, Pablo, if that is okay with you. Yes, perfect. Uh, can I recommend any book, any book with these uh, illustrations? Well, yeah, of course, uh, books would be in Spanish, if that is okay. Uh, but Pablo Escalante, I'm going to type it in the chat. Pablo Escalante is one of the historians, art historians, that uh, has many publications with this kind of topic. Um, also, uh, Teresa Curiarte, I have to mention that these two scholars are from the UNAM, <laughs> so this is important. And also, you can actually, uh, the CEPE, the, the Center for Foreign Studies, has courses that Avan gives, <laughs> not me, Avan, uh, related to these topics where you would actually be able to see all the different things that we saw with much more detail. So that would be something to consider. Um, uh, I, just thank you so much for all your comments. In early nomad society, the sculptures of priests and common people are shown as women. I'm curious what was the gender dynamics back then. That's an amazing question. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but um, yeah. So the feminine, the feminine topic is was really relevant, but also men were represented in figurines with uh, different topics. Um, it's very, we don't really know how it worked, but it's very probable that in these first societies, uh, female had a much important role in uh, some probably political and social uh, circles, you know. And eventually, <laughs> um, it's not that women disappeared, of course, but uh, the role changed a bit. And um, it's interesting because uh, women and uh, feminine figures start to be representing, represented as goddess. That is something that can be actually quite interesting. Uh, sorry, I'm just going to be reading. I would like to ask, can the meaning of the image of the snake vary from the regions? Yes, of course. Something that we have to understand, uh, the question is, is, is if um, the meaning of the snakes vary, vary from regions? Yes, completely. Uh, as I was mentioning, if you remember, we saw that in Tutuacan there was this call to the feather serpent, get a cuddle. But then, but then um, um, this feather serpent appears later on time. It's not the same meaning. It's not as related to water as it was in Tutuacan, for example. That's important. It's actually related in one, in, in, for one, uh, in, in one uh, site with a, a specific governor from Tula, which was Quetzalcoatl, which is a um, historical, mythical persona, you know, Quetzalcoatl, and also with these more warfare topics. And I was, I want to uh, add up something that Avan is actually saying to me in this moment, is that women among the mystics, which is in modern Oaxaca, uh, they also had uh, mystic, the mystics had uh, governors that were women, so that is also important. 
all this idea of the role, gender roles is very different also in different uh, in all the different regional sub sub regions from South America. Since when uh, Lena Chao is asking, since when you are passionate of my career and when where did I study? Okay, um, Avan and I both uh, are extremely passionate about our careers, and I believe both of them, both of us, sorry, uh, were passionate since we were kids, since we were children, and we both study in the National School of Anthropology and History here in Mexico City. Uh, in um, what was the most popular? Stones used in jewelry. Okay, is there any illustrated book? Okay, Karen, thank you for your uh, uh, question. Yeah, popular stones used in jewelry. Um, this is also okay. So gold was used, but it wasn't so common actually. Uh, turquoise. Um, okay, this is important and it's pretty actually related to China. In Mesoamerica, oh, in, in Mesoamerica we don't have jade, have it? But we have a variant of jade, jadeite, which is a green stone. So many green stones were actually used in jewelry because it's actually related to this idea of the water environment. I hope that makes sense. Um, gold was important, but it wasn't as valuable as, um, as green stones, actually. And we have tons and tons of representation of. Uh, representations of um, uh, small sculptures and objects created with green stones that were extremely valuable. I hope that answers the, the, that question. Uh, means means when you started. Uh, when, when I started to study, since I was 18 years old, my career, we are both archaeologists and we are now um, yeah, historians, archaeologists, we, we, we love <laughs> all this kind of topic, Ellen. I hope that is what you're asking. Uh, I am an artist in this information. Help me a lot. Thank you, Laura, Pablo. I found interesting that there were no depictions of rulers in Teotihuacan. Is it possible they had female rulers? Or did they have predominantly male rulers? Female deities were very important to them. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't have, okay, so this is, this is a, a difficult question because it's very complex. Apparently, in what was happening in Teotihuacan is that there wasn't a system, a political system where only one person would rule. Apparently, four persons were in charge of political power and maybe four rulers. And we don't have the representations of these four rulers, what we have apparently is some kind of representation of four um, groups in Teotihuacan, but it's, it's like a collective uh, group, a collective, um, yeah, like a, collect, a group of people. But probably there were like individuals, you know, representing each collective uh, barrios, which is the, the name that uh, in, in English would be borrowed. I, I think, well, yeah, groups. And uh, I don't know if they have female rulers. That is a really good question. We don't have any kind of evidence that suggests that. Avan, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm quite sure that this is the, the thing. No, apparently, um, it's something, it's a question that no one has actually answered. But what we do know is that probably four, four groups were in charge. And we don't exactly know who was, you know, who was who, but at least we know that, that four, four groups were um, ruling in Totiwakan. So thank you for the answer, uh, the, the question. And maybe I could recommend you uh, Linda Manzanilla, another scholar from the UNAM, is actually uh, the archaeologist that has really made a lot of research on this topic. So if you want that name written down, I can just type it in the, in the chat so you can have more uh, information. Um, obviously, thank you. Thank you so much for your, all your comments. From which culture or period do we have the most information? Um, tricky question. 
Yeah, so the thing is, so we have a lot of information from the Aztecs because of all the Greek sources that we have from the 16th century. <coughs> we have a lot of sources, written sources, codex, etc., from the Aztecs. But also, I would say, we have a lot of information and data, archaeological and data from the Mayan area also that is actually being um, discovered thanks to all the epigraphies and all the work that has been done with the, the glyphs, <laughs> the spread of the glyphs, etc. So that is also something to mention. Uh, but I would say that probably the society that we have more information from are the ones from the 16th century, the one that is more, uh, more important probably the Aztecs. Uh, I have been in Chichen Itza since Stan B, and I like Maya culture very much. I just wonder if they really could predict the end of the world. I just got a lot of rumors. Yeah, <laughs> the rumors. Uh, no, it's not the end of the world that they were predicting. They were predicting the end of a specific cycle, which is called Bactun. So imagine, we have years. We, our lives is um, organized in years, and each year gets to an end every 31 first of December. It's the same. They had different types of cycles, different cycles of time. Each cycle had a specific name and a specific duration. So what they were actually referring in this Stella to the end of the world is not the end of the world. It was the end of Abaktum, which is one of the cycles. So I hope that helps clarify a little bit more about those rumors. Um, could uh, you please give some clues of important artists about corn for his Hispanic period? Yes, corn. Okay. In Mayan air art, there are representations of corn. Um, well, the corn, okay, so that is another huge topic that we maybe should have included. Yes, corn is very important. Mayan. Uh, in the Mayan era, there is even uh, in Kakashla, the mural that we saw, the, the city that we saw in Kakashla has depictions of, um, of corn plants. And it's very interesting because the corn plant is representing the corn as a human head. There is an analogy between the human body and the corn plant that is very important. And uh, this is something that we have, uh, that we find among, among the Mayan. And for this specific representation that I'm talking about is in Kakashla, in the center of Mexico. So, and uh, also a topic, very, a very important topic that is represented in many, many, many Mayan examples is the birth of the corn. Because the whole cycle of the corn has mythical, it has a, a mythical -like dimension. You know, the corn is represented as a god with a human shape and the, the idea of the corn being uh, put on the earth and then it, how it flourish is uh, it, it's represented as an analogy of this god traveling through the underworld or to the sky. I hope this makes sense. It's a myth. It's the myth of the corn of the bird of the corn. So we have a lot a lot of representations also of this kind of uh, myth. Um, okay. Uh, I was told that some sacrifice is a kind of glory. Is that true? Okay, sacrifice is a tricky topic. <laughs> yeah, so we have to understand something, and this is a great opportunity to explain this. Uh, when we speak of sacrifice among these societies, we have to understand that where they were sacrificing, even if we See that they were, oh, we have the archaeological record that these sacrifices included both animal and human. The idea of the sacrifice is that these humans that were sacrificed were no longer human. They were something else. <laughs> um, sometimes they were actually representations of God. Uh, but when I speak of representations, what I mean is that they thought that this human that was going to be sacrificed was the actual God. So that is different from the idea of thinking we are sacrificing a human. No, 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 you are, we are not sacrificing a human. We are sacrificing a God. So that is very different. And that is why there was a, this kind of honorable idea of being sacrificed because you were not longer human, you became a God. And that was like the most important thing that 
anything any anyone could uh, achieve in life you know to become a dog uh, you know, a dog, a dog. Uh, so i hope this explains this idea of glory it's the same I, I i remember well in the game in the ball game matching you know this this ritual ball game and the winner would also sometimes be sacrificed if i'm not mistaken and it would also be a winner so sometimes yeah that happened because they thought of this ritual different uh, from, of what we could think in the present. Okay. Do you think there is one more potential than the other ones? What is the main extinction in Spanish, the main reason? No, I don't think there is one um, civilization more evolved than the other. Uh, each civilization has uh, each one of these different groups and societies has many, 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 you know, uh, ideas and they are extremely complex. And sometimes I believe that we think of them as simpler or as uh, different, uh, not as complex, because we don't know as much as we, as we could from them, you know, because there, it's a very long time ago. That is one thing. And the, re the main reason, it's not extinction, they didn't disappear. And that is important to mention also. Even if Teotihuacan collapsed, uh, it was never abandoned, you know, and well, not, not for a long time, actually, after the, the fall of the power. Uh, people left the Tiwakan, but many, many, many people still lived there for a long, long time. And the same happened with the Maya extinction or collapse, you know. Uh, yes, of course, many of the main cities were also abandoned, but not completely. And they, they disappear. They just move out from these places and establish new cities. So that is also important. And the reasons behind these collapses, uh, it's very complex. Sometimes it would have to be related, it could be related probably with political um, conflicts inside societies or uh, probably uh, climate changes also that would affect the, uh, distribu the, the distribution of resources etc and of course about the spaniards the spaniards when the spaniards arrive everything changes but that is what we're going to see tomorrow it's not that they disappeared and it's very important that the art um the art uh, that we have seen in this lecture uh, we're going to talk about it again in a few topics tomorrow okay i hope that I, that answers you your question diego uh, thank you all for your uh, comments. Is cacao ceremonies from prehispanic period? Yes, cacao was used in ceremonies also. Um, it's, it, they were not using that uh, beverage to reach a kind of alter. They didn't use that beverage to, to get drunk, to say it simply. But they they really uh, did use this beverage in different ceremonies. Uh, we have representations both in the Mayan area and in central Mexico in a Pakistani city called Cholula. So yes, they were used. Uh, yes, the cacao plays an, a really important role. It wasn't only a coin, used as a coin, but it was also a ritual beverage, as I just mentioned. Uh, yeah, yeah, OK. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, for your, your comment on human sacrifice. I hope that it, uh, that's clear. Thank you all for all your questions. That was amazing. <laughs> we hope hopefully tomorrow you will be as interested as, as, as today. I don't think anyone is. First, um, Avenue you were centric to this topic is quite a lot of science and political for interpretations of all <laughs> Yes, I completely agree with you. Uh, we have to understand that a lot of the interpretations that we have from pre-Hispanic societies come exactly from people from Europe <laughs> that were there in the 16th century, you know, because they arrived and they have this wisdom system that we know, that we are familiar with. So it's very important to try to understand the perspective from the, the way to say this in the use point of view. So I hope this is, this is helpful, especially uh, particularly with topics, topics such as uh, sacrifice. Thank you again for your question.
Well, thank, thank, thank you very much, professors um, Mariana Avila and Avan Flores. Um, well, um, tomorrow we will con continue with the second conference that is about the colonial period. Yeah. Um, everybody is welcome again. Um, if there is uh, no more questions, we can end the session for for today, and it was really a, a pleasure to to listen, uh, Dr. Fabila, her excellent presentation. Thank you, Pablo, and thank you all. We are really thankful for your interest. We hope to see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. then. Great. Good, good night in. in good night and good morning, everyone. See you tomorrow.